Hey, what's up, Pulsar fam? You guys know my name, and today we're going to jump back into the world of My Hero Academia to further explore the strange yet much loved timeline of Hero Killer Stain taking Izuku Midoriya under his wing. And as always, a quick recap. When we last left off, this timeline had finally passed through the events of the first My Hero Academia movie. The major events being pretty much the same, though some highlights being that Deku and Stain making up and Stain helping Class 1A free the pro heroes. The magnet villain Wolfram was defeated virtually the same way, and a new yet at the same time old villain is born, from Stain's subconscious no less, and we return to this story now. In the aftermath of the attack on the island, things went very much the same as they did in the original film, but fueled by anger and guilt, Stain would have been the first on a plane off the island and back to Japan. His son for Sendal was beginning now, and luckily, the retired hero, Gran Torino, decided to join him in his investigation. And not long after this, a string of murders would be committed, the victims all being pro heroes that a formerly small time vigilante known as Sten Dahl was committing. He was now called the hero killer and considered a full time villain. And the worst part is his message was already beginning to spread a bit more effectively than Stain's message was in canon. They are essentially the same, though Sten Dahl is way more aggressive and in a way, way more charismatic. You see, Sten Dahl being Stain's subconscious in a way is the unrated Stain. He doesn't have any of the inhibitions that Stain has developed by being around Deku in this timeline, so his ambition is the only thing that really matters to him, and his ambition is a lot darker in this timeline. And from Stain being taken under All Might's wing, Sten Dahl has learned how to be a lot more charismatic, and it's making his message a lot easier to spread, so any news coverage only spreads it even further. Essentially, when Sten Dahl speaks, People can't help but listen, and some even agree. Essentially, he is beginning to slowly corrode the public's faith in heroes on his own and was improving the behavior of other pros through fear. As for other things, well, after a surgery to remove the bullet in Bakugo's shoulder and probably some physical therapy, I imagine he would be fully recovered from the fight with Wolfram. This time allows him to properly try and process all the info he learned from Deku on the island. But here's the thing. Bakugo's emotions here are pretty much all over the place. On one hand, he isn't too happy that Deku not only has All Might in his corner, but also Stain. He kind of feels like Deku is having a lot of this success handed to him. But on the other, he is self-aware. He realizes that Deku is quirkless and that he has always had his own amazing quirk and has always been very intelligent. So it was kind of hard to justify being jealous when you really get down to it. And remember, Bakugo's first instinct was to take a bullet for Deku. So I think that he recognizes Deku as All Might's successor, and he definitely resents this, but to an extent, he also wants Deku to succeed because that means that Bakugo can surpass him, and if he does that, that means he is truly the undisputed number one. It's a similar mindset to where he is now in the current manga, but the respect between him and Deku, it still just isn't there yet. And once Bakugo was fully healed, the summer training camp was to begin, and I believe the events that led up to it would be extremely similar there will be no run in between Shigaraki and Deku in the mall though because there was no Hosu City incident and the timing just doesn't fit anymore. So everything that happens from the arrival to the camp until the Wawa Pussycats test of courage goes nearly exactly the same. But then on this very night, absolutely nothing happens. The only thing of real note is that Bakugo and Deku also have those remedial lessons that those that lost their tests against the teachers had since All Might did defeat them. To put it bluntly, there is no attack by the villains. It just wouldn't make sense for this timeline. Number one, Bakugo didn't win the sports festival. Even though he tied for third with Deku, I think he would be way more satisfied with the sports festival outcome since he pretty much gave it his all and it just wasn't enough. He might grimace or frown a little bit, but I don't think that shows him to be villain material really. So there goes the league's major reason for the attack. And while you could argue that they would still attack to kill students, I disagree. Dobby, Toga, and Spinner have not joined the league, meaning they are down three people. I actually think that they would begin to kill heroes after hearing the more effective message of Sten Dahl, but since he hasn't joined the league, neither have they. This makes the Vanguard action squad, Muscular, Mustard, Twice, and Mr. Compress, and possibly a weaker Nomu, and that puts them against Racerhead, Vlad King, the Wild Wild Pussycats, and maybe 40 Hero Corps students, and then you take into account that a lot of those students are very powerful. Those aren't good odds, and it's not the type of strategic move that All for One would make, or allow. So there is no attack. Instead, Off One encourages Shigaraki to bide his time and amass more power and allies and study this new Stendhal character, see what his rhetoric is really about. And this means that the entire training camp goes uninterrupted, which in my opinion means a major power up for all the Class 1A and Class 1B students. 
And as the anime has done, I'm going to leave the training that a lot of the members of Class 1B undergo as very vague. In the joint training arc, every Class 1B quirk is revealed, and a lot of them will probably undergo some specialized training, like what Bakugo and Todoroki are doing, so you wouldn't see them doing the more uniform workouts type stuff that we see Deku doing. I'm not really sure what Monomo would do, honestly, and Kendo would probably work on her arms or maybe do climbing, and Tetsu Tetsu would probably train with Kirishima and Ojiro. I don't mind giving training out for those three because we know their quirks very, very well at this point. Those of you who are anime only have seen a few other Class 1B quirks, but I don't want to give out any spoilers at all, and forewarning, I'm about to leave a lot of things in this video vague to avoid spoilers for you guys that have only watched the anime for virtually the rest of the video. And that said, I want to genuinely ask my manga reading viewers to be courteous to others in the comment section and give a spoiler warning before you make your comments. I'm super curious what you guys think the specialized quirk training for Class 1B would be, but I just want to be courteous to everyone. Now, for the sake of simplicity, let's assume that every day of the camp was going to be the same thing over and over again. So, Bakugo would be plunging his hands into boiling water and then creating bigger and bigger explosions every day for one week. There might be some slight deviation here and there to keep things from being too boring for the students, but that's a bit of speculation that we just don't have too much time for. Now, remember a statement that Eraserhead made. He said he wanted to get an entire second semester's worth of training done in one week. This is why I'm calling this a major power boost. While the training here won't be fueled by the urgency to get the students powered up because of all the attacks on UA by the League of Villains, in this timeline, it is still pretty intense. It's just not really fueled by the fear of the students being in constant danger. Let's also remember that Deku was able to raise his off for one limit from 5% to 8%. Now, I'm not sure if this has been explained somewhere and I just missed it, but keep in mind, his starting limit was 5%. So this does mean that he could have been improving from when he first got one for all, till now. But I would kind of disagree. Deku unleashes 8% in his fight with Bakugo because he gets excited and loses a bit of control, causing him to forget to hold back. I would argue that if Deku's limit had been steadily rising, then we probably would have seen it rise before the fight with Bakugo. But that said, we've never seen him use 6 even 7% in any of his other fights where he gets very emotional, like against Todoroki, All Might, or Muscular. Full disclosure, I don't count Stain in this because that was the debut of Full Cowling, and Deku was pretty much constantly telling himself to remain at 5% and be controlled. So with this idea in mind, I think we can say that because this training was actually aimed towards strengthening the student's quirks, it does so very much, such as Deku raising his physicality through the hardcore workout he did. And it just makes sense, if you want to strengthen a certain muscle, you isolate your workout to that muscle. Oh, and I'm not really sure how Kodo would turn out in this timeline. I think Deku would keep going to talk to him, and over time, maybe Kota can kind of understand where he's coming from, just out of shonen logic, but nowhere near as much as he would after, you know, in canon where Deku saves him. I'm curious what you guys think would happen to him here. Deku doesn't have to save him, he may open his mind a tiny bit, but never fully, and Muscular never attacks him, so he never even finds out the reason his parents were killed. Personally, I think he gets only a bit nicer, and that's about it. As for the training results, in part 3, Deku was able to use his full cowling at 7% comfortably, because Stain's physical training made him nearly superhuman on its own. In part 4, he spent his entire internship with Gran Torino, basically only doing combat training. And with this whole week of pushing his body and its work to the limit, I think raising his limit now to 12% is very reasonable. As for the other students, Ida's stamina right now would be incredible because of the training he did with Ingenium for his internship. Likewise, Kirishima can hold his hardening for a significantly longer amount of time, and for lack of a better term, he's harder. Bakugo's sweat glands are larger and more active, and he can make bigger explosions that would usually cause him pain and take way less recoil damage. Ayama's naval laser lasts longer before tummy aches, Yayi Rose can make more items for growing tired. Holy crap, I still have 14 people. Okay, let's TLDR this. If someone's quirk has a physical limit to it, that limit is now much higher. If it's a stamina issue, that stamina is now lengthened, and the quirk itself should definitely receive a power up. Though I will say that Todoroki's control and speed is getting better fine-tuned, and Tokoyami has better control over Dark Shadow in the dark, but not to an extent where it's viable in a fight. And I believe this bare bones description should cover just about everyone, and again for Class 1B, I don't want to spoil those quirks. And I also think that the rest of the summer after the camp is going to be aimed towards creating ultimate moves and gaining provisional licenses, but since there was no attack on the camp, they began that training way earlier. I don't remember specifically if there were any reasons for the students to be pushed to get their licenses that were based solely on the League of Villains, but again, this was tied into the summer training camp, so I believe that this is still a goal now in this timeline. And surprisingly, I think the dorm room system would still be instituted. 
Principal Nezu makes the claim that he's willing to instate the dorms for a while in chapter 83, and in chapter 97, he reveals in his thoughts that the big reason for instating the dorms was to help sniff out the UA mole. These two statements combined by the head of UA caused me to think that the dorms were an inevitability, and the only way to avoid them is likely by eliminating the mole, which nothing in this timeline has done to really change that. So the big change is that there is no groveling to the parents. UA has only ever had one real attack on it and it was handled pretty well, so the reputation of the school isn't too bad as of right now. Stendhal and the League of Villains just by doing their own thing are kind of hitting the hero society and their way of viewing heroes, but it's just not so significant that any of the parents really feel a need to hold their children back. So moving into the dorms goes pretty smoothly. There's going to be some tears because this is basically leaving for college for a lot of these guys, but other than that, it goes pretty well. And I don't see any reason to change the winner of the dorm room contest, though Sue isn't sad here and she does participate. The negative of this is that I felt this moment in the series provided the class, at least these seven people involved in this moment, some bonding time. But by living together, I feel like they'll be getting closer as a class no matter what. From here, I believe that training for ultimate moves would continue. And this is interesting because with everyone's quirks being significantly stronger and then having more time to work on these moves, they're going to be a lot better by the time of the actual exams. I also think that All Might would help out with tips and tricks for every student. He can only do hero work for about 30 minutes at this point in the story and I think his time is better spent teaching if there's no real villain to fight. So let's talk about what all the students are looking at for those moves. And you're about to hear the phrase, spoiler for the manga a lot. Ochako is definitely going to be way more powerful than her canon version since she can stand floating without getting sick a lot better now, and she'd already trained harder with Gunhead during their internship, so she's going to be extremely dangerous as a fighter and very mobile around the battlefield. Oh, and her other canon special move is a spoiler. Todoroki can probably switch between ice and fire a lot quicker, and his giant ice wall technique is likely a lot faster. His other special move is a spoiler. Ojiro's tail is definitely stronger, and Ectoplasm makes a statement about him not relying on his tail so much. If he has longer to work on this, I think he begins to fight with his arms and legs a bit more. Now in the joint training arc, he has an opponent whose quirk is able to make his tail a big weakness for him. But I think after a full week of beating on both Kirishima and Tetsu Tetsu, his tail is likely stronger and again for lack of a better term, harder. Almost like Kirishima's hardened skin, but not to the same extent, so now it's a very dangerous weapon. Speaking of Kirishima, literally every move he has is a massive spoiler. I'm going to say he currently has every special move he has during the Mafia arc. Sato would be physically stronger, and I imagine his training would make his cognition last longer. Luckily Sato still has no special moves in canon, so we are actually have some free reign for this. That said, his quirk is so straightforward, I can't think of much in terms of creativity. All Might could give him some guidance on how to throw big punches, but that's about it. So let's call his special move the Sweet Smash and move on. I don't count Sue as a spoiler because the anime basically has shown that she can camouflage herself already. It just doesn't get used much until the joint training arc. She'd also be physically stronger from all the climbing she did. Ashido's skin is more resistant to her own acid now, so she would still come up acid veil and be able to use it like a shield a lot more. But I also imagine she would develop her acid kamehameha technique a bit further because she has more time. Everything else is a spoiler. Bakugo's moves are virtually the same, but definitely stronger, and he works some more on his grappling and punching style of fighting that he's based off training with Endeavor. I'm thinking we could maybe call this his burn style. Kaminara would definitely be able to use more electricity for his mind blanks out, but he needs to go to the support team for his costume, and anything else is spoilers. Tokiyami is pretty much the same. His greater control in the dark wouldn't really result in a true blue power increase unless he's in a dark area, and spoilers. Sero is a spoiler, but his current special move isn't viable just anywhere, it's really only certain locations. Aoyama is a spoiler for the manga. Shoji is a spoiler for the manga, but the cool thing is I actually predicted his special move before the manga actually covered it in this video. Hagakure is the exact same, and I imagine that Koda and Jiro will be very similar to their canon counterpart after they get their suit upgrades. Mineta's pop-off limit is definitely raised, but Great Rush is still his ultimate. Yayurozu has a much easier time creating an ultimate move because her stamina is better and spoilers. Ida already has her super burst and anything else is a huge spoiler but his speed and stamina are really increased here. And finally, Deku. The major change in this is that his arms have nowhere near the same amount of damage that they did on Cannon. He has only really broken his arm once or twice in this timeline and nowhere to the extent of what he does by the time he defeats Muscular. 
And with his current one for all in being higher, a 12% short smash is a viable ultimate move. That said, All Might is still going to tell him to stop copying him and to think for himself. That's just something that Deku really needs at this point in his development. But Deku definitely has more trouble coming up with something in this timeline because his arms are perfectly fine and his mind is pretty narrow on this idea and how he uses one for all. I think he would definitely struggle with this for a few days before he maybe decides to call Stain and Gran Torino to ask for advice. Gran Torino would definitely make Deku think of something by himself, but he knows how to guide a person's thought process very well. So here's what I propose Deku comes up with. He has already based how he moves in full cowling, more on how Stain moves than how Bakugo moves. So he could take this a step further and adapt to the hand-to-hand -hand style of Stain. Remember, during their 10 months of training, Stain and Deku did a lot of sparring, and Stain has nurtured Deku's analytical ability to a very high degree, so he has studied how Stain fights with and without a weapon. Stain's fighting style emphasizes speed and agility to put the user in a position to deliver a cut and lick somebody's blood. The last two don't really matter to Deku though, so this new style is going to emphasize the use of speed and agility, while putting Deku in a position to deliver any kind of strong attack, no matter the body part. We've only really seen Stain throw one kick, but to me, Stain is a fighter of opportunity, so Deku will use kicks in this type of fighting. It's all about being efficient and opportunistic, so in this style, Deku will use punches, over the shoulder throws, grapples, kicks, elbows, knees, hell, maybe even chokeholds and headbutts. It's channeling the fast paced and brutal yet efficient style of fighting that Stain uses, while using the enhancement from One for All. In short, it's about the perfect fusion between All Might and Stain. I'm not sure what you want to call this though, one for all full cowling stain style, street style, bloody style, or maybe just keep it as shoot style. I'm actually going to give you guys a poll on what the name should be. And I also see no real reason for Deku not to get suit upgrades. He likely still gets arm braces and more leg bracing just in case, but I think he may not have his iron soles here. During that phone call with Stain and Gran Torino, they are very proud of his continued progress and they promise to be at the licensing exams to cheer him on. For now, they are following the lead on Stendhal though. Our scene changes to the bar that the League of Villains uses as their base. Shigaraki and the rest of the League are currently speaking with All for One through the TV. That is until a knock on the door comes. The League begin to prepare for battle, but the door is actually sliced apart, and in walks the new and famous hero killer, Stendhal. Muscular moves to take Stendhal on, but he actually passes out by the powerful will and bloodlust of the hero killer. The only person able to really move now was Shigaraki, as his willpower is strong enough for it. Stendhal walks slowly over to him in the TV that All For One speaks through. He then trembles a bit and removes his mask. The real sword kill begins to beg All For One for his help. If he took away the other quirk that he gave him, then Stendhal wouldn't have control over his mind anymore. But then sword kill's voice changes and Stendhal puts his mask back on. Stendhal was here to offer the League a deal. Help him take full control over this body, and he would join them. In the past, he felt that killing villains was his purpose, but he now knew that fake heroes were the real Stain on this world. And because Stendhal is a much darker and uninhibited version of Stain, he felt that all current heroes need to be wiped out to really save society. This even includes All Might, because Stendhal could no longer respect the number one hero. Like All for One, Stendhal now knew of All Might's true form. This had caused Stendhal to lose all respect for All Might, as he now could not protect the world as he needed to. So, he looks towards the future. Literally. There was only one person he refused to kill. One true hero. And Stendhal would mold him into a symbol of peace that would keep all other heroes as true and perfect as he is. Yuzuku Midoriya had to live. But, that plus ultra frames will be leading the story off of right now. I know this part was a lot different from the rest of this series, but I need to get some groundwork done and this doesn't feel like a true side story, so it is a main part. I also need to conduct a few polls and here are two more. Are you personally an anime only or are you reading that My Hero Academia manga? I'm trying to see what my demographics are here. And do you think that my My Hero Academia what ifs should go at the pace of the manga or the pace of the anime? I've basically already made up my mind on this, but I still want to hear what everyone as a majority thinks. This video is already pretty long, so I won't miss words. Discord, Twitter, like, comment, subscribe, and please hit the notification bell. And shout out to my patrons for the newbie tier. We have Lone Wolf McQuaid and Treb, Heroes in Training tier, Pizza 15 x and Knuckles OX, and a huge shout out to the Plus Ultra tier patron, Robert Smith. And as always, be sure to take care of yourselves and go beyond Plus Ultra. 
See you guys next time.